Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? Don't you hate it when people say they don't want to talk about politics? Well, if you've been listening to our show, you know everything is political. And so does our next guest, Marquita Thomas, who's running for West Hollywood City Council and is currently the executive director of the Los Angeles LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce. She is a speaker with her own TED Talk. She is an award-winning marketing and brand consultant and event developer who knows her way around Hollywood. She is the owner of Out and About Events for Women Deeply. This woman deeply understands the world of brand marketing, PR, creating TV, radio, and multimedia campaigns and red carpet event productions. This woman walks the red carpet every day and is a leader in her community. Take all these skills and ingredients, mix them up, put them in the slow cooker, and voila, a winner. We can't wait for JD to delve in. Welcome, Marquita. Susie's introductions are the best, Marquita. I see. I was listening like, who? Who is this person? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susie. So, Marquita, you, obviously easy to write that introduction for. You've done so much. So let's start off with your past. Where did you grow up? What were the major milestones in your journey that led you to your arrival at Occidental? Oh, that's a great question. I grew up in a lot of places. I was born on Fort Bragg in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Then my parents took me back to New York for just a little bit before we went to New Orleans. And then at the age of 10, uh, we moved to the fourth state that we lived in, and that was Sumter, South Carolina. I grew up on a dirt road in Sumter, South Carolina before coming to Los Angeles. Oh, and so what were the milestones besides moving around and being pretty fluid at that? What were the things that pop out in your mind, the themes or, or things that helped to develop who you are today? Well, we moved a lot. We moved, we really moved a lot. We moved every year. My mom, my mom just liked to kind of explore new places. And I saw a lot going from different areas of South Carolina. And ultimately I decided that I needed to go to private school because the school system was so subpar in South Carolina but we really couldn't afford parochial school. So I had to go into a work study program. So at the ages of 13, 14, 15, 16, I was uh, cleaning. They made us clean the school. That was how we paid off our tuition. So I was scrubbing toilets and mopping floors. And then I kind of messed around and uh, did the teacher's lounge a little too well one time. And so the teachers uh, said that they only wanted me cleaning the teacher's lounge from now on. So I had to clean the teacher's lounge <laughs> and whatever else I was tasked with doing. But I really knew that I wanted to get a good education and I knew that going to parochial school would be the pathway to that because I knew that I ultimately wanted to go to college and so we had to make it work. And since we couldn't afford it, I had to do what I needed to do um, in order to pay off my tuition. And then while I was at school, I got a lookbook for Occidental College and I flipped through it one time and I said, this is my school. This is my school, I have to go. It was a multicultural school, a liberal arts college, it had a black president and it was in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I did I did what, what limited research one could do pre-internet. And I said, this is just my school. And what I, I, I just forged ahead and everyone's, no one was behind me. It was so funny. It was uh, my my uh, guidance counselors, my teachers, my friends, my family. They were like, what makes you think you're going to the big city? What makes you think you're going to Los Angeles? And I was like, I'm going. So I uh, filled out the application. I didn't even have the application fee. I just sent it like here, <laughs> this is this is it. And the school said, amazing, we we want you, you're, um, you're accepted. 
And my family, my friends, my guidance counselor, my teachers, again, said, well, that's great. But who grows up on a dirt road in Sumter, South Carolina and goes to a $100,000 school? And I said, this girl. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> apparently I do. <laughs> I said, that's that it's, it's happening, folks. You're, you're going to have to get on board. And uh, I just really had the tenacity and I really, really wanted to go to this school. And um, it didn't look like we were going to be able to afford it the first year. So I was preparing to go to a, a local school um, and I said to myself, if I can't go to Occidental the first year, I'm, I'm going to transfer the second year. And right when we were sending the deposit to the local college, um, my mom said, stop everything. You got a free, a full scholarship. It's <laughs> just like. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so um, that's how I, uh, you know, ended up at Occidental College, came out to Los Angeles and couldn't imagine living anywhere else. Okay. So now I want to back up a little bit because first of all, as if it's not humbling enough to grow up in South Carolina on a dirt road, you had to clean to be able to afford. So I, I can't imagine both the humility you know, in terms of like humble, not, not, you know, it's, it's, it's creates humility, but like you were humbled. Right. And then on top of that, to have the tenacity, I mean, that's an interesting combination. That's, I mean, it's incredible. I, I did nothing like that. I, I was, you know, an actor outer from way back and try to find as many different ways to drop out of society as I could. <laughs> so I'm always fascinated by somebody. And I was on fascinated by being able to Oh, no, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. But I, and yeah. I was also a cheerleader, no. student body vice president. Um, I was in band. I just I was just involved and I had to do all of my activities after I finished, you know, scrubbing toilets. That's wild. I, I really I don't even have I don't even have a better word than that. That's amazing. How about that? And and impressive. And so you landed this black woman in West Hollywood at some point. Was there a learning curve? What was it like for you? You know, believe it or not, there wasn't. I, I had already been in Los Angeles for four years because I came here to go to college. And, you know, I think the biggest culture shock was the fact that Los Angeles didn't have ditches. I was like, where does the water go? I don't. Um, aside from that, I didn't I didn't have a huge learning curve. Um, you would think that it would have been a huge shock to go from a very rural rural community to Los Angeles. But I think partly because my parents were New Yorkers and I would spend time in New York. And, you know, so I've seen big buildings. I've seen, you know, bright lights. It wasn't yeah. that it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, I did come to Los Angeles and I'm you're going to um, be able to figure out my age in a second. I came to Los Angeles about seven months before the Rodney King beatings. Um, so um, that was obviously a culture shock in that, you know, the, there was a and we're on the 30 year anniversary of that. Right. So um, wow. that was that was a culture shock because there were conversations happening that never would have happened in South Carolina. And I would say that mm -hmm. that moment actually had a huge impact into who I am now because it set me on my D, E and I journey in that. I found myself at a very young age having these conversations around race that I couldn't respond to. I mean, I had people asking me like, why are black people tearing up their own communities? And I mean, black, white people get pulled over as well. And I was in a position where I said, I never want to, I never want to be in a position where I can't respond, where people are asking me these questions, asking me these questions about race, whether or not I should even be asked these questions in the first place is a completely different conversation, but I always wanted to be able to respond. And I understood the, um, I understood the visceral response to Rodney King, you know, as, I mean, as a black person, obviously, no matter how old you are, you can, res you know, you understand that, but people were asking questions about economics and, and disparity and all these different questions that at 17 years old, I was like, I don't, I don't know how to respond. And so I just started reading about, I started reading a lot about race and how we got here and how we move forward. And um, that really just set me on my DE and I journey and I've never looked back. So let me just be specific. You landed in West Hollywood after going to Occidental. Mm -hmm. 
you, you were at Occidental for four years and then, and then you moved to West Hollywood mm-hmm. and you weren't expecting more diversity. You were just ready for what came. You weren't, you weren't thinking that, you, you know, it would be like Occidental more diversity. Are you asking me if I thought West Hollywood was going to be diverse? I, the conversation I was referring yeah. to yeah. happened on, on the college campus, but um, I just had an opportunity. I, the apartment I'm standing in right now is the apartment I moved into after college yeah. and I've never moved. <laughs> that's, that's, that's wild too. So, yeah, that's crazy. So so you went to college, you were having all these conversations about race that you've never had before in a diverse community, and then you moved right into West Hollywood. And so you were prepared for for a different community because you had been with this diverse uh, diverse group of people in college. In college. So the idea that West Hollywood as, is diverse is, I mean... There is some diversity. It's certainly not as diverse as my college campus, which um, had um, much was was just far more racially diverse. But I will say, um, interestingly enough, even though I grew up in a red state, I, I lived in red states for 17 years. Um, I moved to West Hollywood, and within four months, I got called the N word for the first time in my entire life. Um, and I've only been called that word a couple of times. Um, but the, the large percentage of times it has been in West Hollywood, I do have to, I have to be honest about that. Yeah. Wow. That's what I was wondering. I was wondering if, if you were prepared for what you moved into and clearly that was a shocker. My goodness. So look, I, I lived in LA for 20 years and I personally don't know anyone who does not know Marquita Thomas. So (laughs) how has, how has being this public persona impacted your personal journey? I would say it's definitely been for the best. I have had some amazing experiences. I started doing women's events six months after I could say to myself that I was part of the community. I came out a lot later in life and I like to clarify what coming out means because most times when people say coming out, I think that that means that they knew, they just weren't telling people. I had no idea. I was in my late twenties, and it was a it was a bit of a shocker because you think in your late twenties you know everything there is to know about yourself. You're like, I know my politics, I know my values, I know who I am as a person, and you just don't expect to learn this new thing about yourself at twenty six because at twenty six you think you know yes. everything. And so I, you know, uh, was able to say it to myself like this is this is who I am. And then six months later, I started throwing women's events because I was really frustrated by the lack of resources for women. I threw parties, I had networking events, I did conferences, and then I got to know other um, LGBTQ POC um, uh, organizations and promoters and things like that around the country. And so I started just going around the country, helping people expand their networks and their organizations and it, you know, it got to a point where I could just get on a plane and go to pretty much any state and someone was like, hey, Marquita. So that was, uh, that was always really amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. For, I mean, look, whatever you consider coming out, the fact that you evolved so quickly, uh, that's incredible. I mean, do you ever look at it and say, you know, look back and just say, my journey has been so incredible. You seem still seem so humble about it. So um, I think because I'm one of those people that's always looking for the next thing. Like sometimes I, I like, you know, Susie said what she said and I was like, oh yeah, I've kind of done some stuff and we haven't even started talking <laughs> about like the music festival and all the other things. Um, I'm always looking to the next thing. So I do, I do sometimes forget <laughs> about the other things. Um, but I'm really, I'm really very, very, very proud of um, some of the things that I've done, particularly the Seraphim Women's Music Festival and the events that I've thrown for women. It's, it's just always amazing when people say, you know, I met my best friend at one of your events, I met my partner at one of your events, um, or you know, your event was one of the first things I went to when I was coming out or when I came to Los Angeles. Um, I I did events for uh, women of color during the Dinah Shore weekend. Um, women of color were really looking for something during that weekend. And so, yeah, I'm very, very proud of those things. But like I said, sometimes, sometimes I really do forget. I do. 
Well, and I think it's important to pause and for me to reflect that it's incredible. I mean, I, I mean that sincerely. It's like, I, you know, when we, Susie and I were going through, I was like, I know all the stuff she did, but oh my gosh, I didn't know all of this. So I do think it's important for you to hear that. So I'm glad you can receive it. Thank you. So you've had significant accomplishments in business, in the business community. Then you were appointed to the planning commission. Mm -hmm. You said you wanted to increase the level of service to the city. This included advocacy for minority businesses and communities, including affordable housing. This seemed like a lofty goal then. It seems like a lofty goal now. What would you say about that? Has it been received well? Uh, thank you for that. So yes, I'm on the Planning Commission. Um, prior to being on the Planning Commission, I was co-chair of the Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board. Um, and then I, was, I went on to the Human Services Commission and I am the first woman of color on the Planning Commission. Uh, and I wanted to, my goals were exactly as you said, I always advocate for more affordable housing. We know that West Hollywood um, has become very expensive to live in. And we have inclusionary housing, which is amazing. Um, and sometimes our inclusionary housing doesn't go far enough. You know, it doesn't, um, I'm always advocating for more, you know, two bedroom units so that people um, with families can come to the city as well as, you know, having our seniors who have caregivers, they need two bedroom units that are affordable. We also need mm -hmm. to yeah, we really do. And we also need to look at, you know, how do we go beyond um, inclusionary housing? Can we reduce our parking requirements? We know that parking is why so much housing um, costs so much. So, you know, you may not know this, but it's been studies show that about 17 percent of your rent goes towards uh, paying the owner back for the parking. So if we could reduce it, yeah. <laughs> there's a huge, like if, if people could reduce their reliance on cars, we could reduce parking and then we could ultimately reduce the price of, of housing. So, you know, where, where it makes sense, you know, advocating for parking reductions, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. If it's a busy um, area of town, you actually want more parking. But if it's, especially if it's transit oriented, mm -hmm. Um, housing, we want to do a reduction in parking because we want people to get on those, um, get on those trains, get on those buses, um, maybe take ride share, uh, get on the bike, whatever the case may be. Um, so sometimes with some projects, it's like, you know, we need to reduce parking. Sometimes we need to, um, you know, increase parking, but looking at the different ways that we can make more of our units affordable um, for everyone, but also, you know, making them affordable for marginalized communities um, is something that's really, really important to me. I, I'm so thrilled to hear you say that because, you know, you said it that years ago, you know, arriving in West Hollywood, I did not find it inviting at all, you know, being a, a black lesbian. I found it, I was really uncomfortable. I felt like I was constantly being side-eyed and asked extra questions if I went into a club or a bar. So it's great to hear that, you know, what's your focus? I just think it's so important. Do you think that's changed? You know, it's more welcoming now that you've been active in the community and really raising awareness and, ad and with your advocacy? So I always tell people, you know, Individual businesses, I mean, like, you know, racism is a societal problem. A municipality can't really, it can only do so much in terms of um, addressing um, the business and the business next door. But I think that, you know, with the change in leadership that we currently have had on our city council, um, and it is embracing more of a, a multicultural West Hollywood. And one of the things that I'm doing in my capacity as executive director of the Los Angeles LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce is work that I've done with the city of Los Angeles, and that is advocate for inclusionary procurement. So what that means is it's basically a supplier diversity program. So it's when you're when you're looking at inclusion and you're looking at diversity, it's great to have more people come into the city, but are you contracting with those people? Are you contributing to the economic That's development nice. of, of those people? So, uh, yeah, it's um, I did this, I, like I said, I did this work um, with the city of Los Angeles, making Los Angeles the largest city in the nation at that time to recognize LGBT business enterprises. It was a, you know, a national um, thing. And then New York now has inclusionary procurements. Now New York's the largest city in the in the nation but we were the largest city for like about a year and a half or so um but it took two years of knocking on doors to get that done and now the county has inclusionary procurement and i've also been um providing arguments for an lgbt spend goal with the utilities that just got announced two weeks ago that 
in 2024, the spend will be $600 million with the LGBT small business um, community. So, but just getting back to communities of color, um, the inclusionary procurement that I'm hoping will happen in West Hollywood, will it, the inclusionary procurement will include LGBT, but also um, communities of color. And then the city I know is also looking at different incentives to bringing in more POC business owners. Um, you can't do anything about, you know, Ted and Jeff and Rod, you know, because sure. again, racism is a societal problem. But the expectation is if you had more businesses run by communities of color, the hope is that they would be um, inclusive to communities of color. I mean, but you know, all kinfolk ain't skinfolk. Yes. All kinfolk ain't kinfolk. But you know, the hope is that <laughs> the hope right. is that if you have more businesses run by communities of color, that they'd, they'd, there'd be more inclusion there. So a couple things. One, you know, I love the idea of deeper roots, and that's what you're talking about. You're talking about more than just inviting people into the city. You're talking about deepening the roots so that there is a need. You know, you need these people because they provide a service and then you provide the service. So that increases relationships. So that's really fascinating and just so smart. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, you're right. Racism is systemic. It's a societal problem. And the fact that people really have to start to recognize that we are no longer the minority. You know, we are the global majority. And so we have to empower ourselves to move as such. And, and realize that our, our our dollars matter in a way that could really make or break someone. Right. So I love the idea of, of, you know, that awakening happening on your watch. I think that's amazing. I think it's also important to have more communities of color with businesses just in general, just for job creation. I mean, we experience so much discrimination in the workplace. Again, the expectation is that if you're working for someone from a diverse community, that it would be in, it would be um, open and welcoming a w welcoming place to work. So we want to have these thriving um, minority businesses in general, um, but we also want to have these thriving minority businesses for job creation um, for people who are you know part of marginalized communities, so they have um, additional places, inclusive places to work. So shifting gears a little bit and talking about change. You're currently running for West Hollywood City Council. You say we, we hold requires change. That's a tongue twister. What is your vision? Thank you for that. So first, I want to say I'm the first black person to run for West Hollywood City Council, if you can believe that. <laughs> um, I've been in service oh, to. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's um, it's it's surprising that we're still celebrating um, first um, in this day and age. But, you know, it is what it is. And, um, you know, I've been in service to West Hollywood for over 15 years. As I mentioned, I was on the Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board, Human Services Commission. I'm a planning commissioner. I was also on the board of L.A. Pride, which is not, you know, necessarily um, city run, but it brought in millions of dollars to the business community of West Hollywood. So I kind of include that in my service to the city. A lot of businesses were getting 25 percent of their annual intake um, during Pride weekend. So I definitely consider that <clears throat> part of my city uh, service. Um, and basically, you know, I've lived, in, I've lived in West Hollywood for 26 years, and I want to ensure that West Hollywood returns to being a great place to work, live, and do business. You know, we have to have public safety in West Hollywood that effectively keeps our streets safe while still respecting the dignity of all who live, work, and visit West Hollywood. We have to tackle homelessness in a proactive way through increased outreach, compassion, and services. We have to actively encourage diversity in our businesses to serve West Hollywood residents and visitors. And we need to strive for a city that's inclusive for all. I mean, elders, students, religious minorities, disabled community, sober community, and, and everyone else. So that those are the pillars of the campaign. So it's public safety, homelessness, pandemic relief, housing affordability and mental health, because in a lot of ways, all of those feed into one another. Well, you know, whenever you have therapists at the table, we're gonna strongly applaud the mental health piece. And I think it's so important, particularly, you know, for the young trans community. And I think it's important to note that the, the highest risk is with um, the black trans community, black trans female community. And it's, it's heart-wrenching 
that it's not more highly profiled, uh, you know, in terms of the disturbance because of the the numbers are staggering. Mm -hmm. And I just love the idea that providing safety and providing jobs and, and, and a place for, for them to be, as well as, like you said, other marginalized communities, it's, it's, it should be that way. This, this should not be a, a, you know, a surprising platform. It just makes sense. Right. So, you know, with mental health also comes, you know, just support, just general support, you know, so support of mental health, support of, you know, recovery services, you know, West Hollywood is a creative, innovative, world renowned city. And we have a lot of nightlife and, and entertainment industries. And we have to take responsibility for the, you know, unintended consequences that they cause. And we need to address the mental health crisis with uh, support for recovery, you know, reducing the stigma of mental health and providing services yes. to those in need. Um, I'm particularly dis disturbed about the um, lack of alarm around, you know, the deaths, the fentanyl deaths. And so there needs to be um, an awareness campaign around that, uh, communications and teaching people how to test for these things. The number of people that we've lost to fentanyl, the pe number of people we've lost to um, suicide, like all of these things, I think, have to be a part of any candidate's platform. Most importantly, it's a part of your platform. And that's yes. why we want you elected. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So <laughs> what do you think the most important thing is for people to know about who you are? Oh, that's a great question. I would say that the most important thing to know about me is that I really truly believe that until all of us are free, none of us are free. I think that we always have to strive to lift up every marginalized community without worrying about if someone else is getting a larger piece of the pie or someone else is getting access before we do. Someone else is getting something that we feel we deserve. Well, we've been at this longer. There's more of us. We have more money um, <laughs> or whatever the case yeah. may be. Um, there's, there's a lot of infighting between marginalized communities. And I think it's very distressing. I think it's by design. I think you know that, JD. It's all by design. <laughs> Don't get me started. Don't get me started. It's by design, but until all of us are free, none of us are free. And so we all have a responsibility to each other. The Black community has an obligation to the trans community. The white LGBTQ community has an obligation to the Asian community. We all have to work together. And unfortunately, there's just way too much infighting and um, talking about why other people don't deserve this or well they do this to us and it's it's um it's really distressing it's and it's really um it's it's halting progress <laughs> and so i really want people to kind of open up their minds i do believe it's by design i also believe it's part of the reason why i've embraced the global majority people respond differently when you talk about us being the global majority mm. it, it changes the culture of conversations um, because we're stronger united. And so it's intentional that I'm constantly pushing that as the reality because it's true. And so when we start to embrace that is when change starts to happen because we, we have economic power. Very much so. Yes, we do. We have economic power. So there's, so there's something, something else. Look, you are a Black woman and always, I, I've never known it not to be, which I'll just say it always is, asked about your agenda as if it's separate from your political message. And I just want to put that out there so you can speak to that. You know, they act like when you're a, a person of color, all of a sudden you've got a sub agenda and you've made it very clear that yours is diverse and it's also welcoming. Do you want to add to that? That's a that's a that's a great question. It's an interesting question. Um, the there's a lot of uh, it's never actually been called an agenda. There's this uh, sort of stop and start that happens a little bit around some conversations where people are kind of like, well, we don't want to talk about race. We don't want to talk about race, but let's talk about race. 
And so there's this mm. uh, back and forth around race. I get I get asked a lot of questions about race and um I think there's sometimes an attempt to a little bit back me into a corner because um, people, everyone's looking for that little sound bite, right? But ultimately, yeah. everything is about what's in the best interest of this city. I love this city. And every decision I make will be for the betterment of this city. And so that is my platform and that is who I am. I've seen a lot of change in the city. You know, in 26 years, I mean, I remember when the firehouse was here. I remember when the Abbey was a, a third the size of what it is right now, when Gelson's was Mayfair. I remember, you know, I can walk through this city and literally point to every single building and say that used to be this and this used to be that. I could talk about the marches that have happened in this city. I remember when Prop 8 was voted on and we all came together in the square. And then I remember when marriage equality um, was passed by the Supreme Court, and we all came together came together in the square. And that's why I'm running for West Hollywood, uh, West Hollywood City Council, is because that's the West Hollywood I know and love. And to reduce me down to um, an identity or a demographic is um, would be would be not fair to me, um, and not fair to um, what I'm looking to do as a candidate. So I hope that people look at me in totality, look at the work that I've done and the progress that I want to bring to the city. Well said. And it's also racist. Let me just add that in there. Ah, there's uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so where can people find you, donate to your campaign, support you in this venture? Talk about it. I appreciate that. Support is so needed. Um, you can find me at Marquita, M-A-R-Q-U-I-T-A, the number four, weho.com. And there is a, my entire platform is on there as well as the donation button. And I hope that people will support. You don't have to live in West Hollywood, obviously. Um, you know, these campaigns are expensive, but I will say um, it's a very strong campaign. I am endorsed by council member John D'Amico, um, who encouraged me to run. Um, I've had some great fundraisers. Um, I actually outraised the current mayor in the end of year filings. Um, so it's a strong campaign, but I still have a very, 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 very long way to go. So um, every little bit helps. And I hope that people will contribute. And I hope that whether you contribute to my campaign or not, I just I, ho I hope that ev everyone listening considers running for office. It's so important, um, especially you know communities of color, trans community, women, everybody, left-handed people. I don't care. Run for office. Run, run again. Run a third time. Run until you win. You can't expect change if you just let the same people um, keep these seats. So. Please, if I don't care if it's school board, I don't care what it is, please, please consider running for office. Okay, so I, I, I'm laughing for another reason as well. In the typical vein of who you say you are, you went to my last question. <laughs> you said, I'm always looking to go ahead. What's it? You went to my last question, so I'm going to ask it anyway. But first, first, what about your social media? Where can people follow you and, and hear what you're saying and, and where you are and what you're doing? Sure. I thought you were going to say that I spoke to you because you're left-handed. And I was like, <laughs> but um, it's my full name. <laughs> it's my full name on everything. I'm at Marquita Thomas on Twitter, Marquita Thomas on Facebook, Marquita Thomas on Instagram. So it's M-A-R-Q-U-I-T-A-T-H-O-M-A-S. Perfect. And my sister's left-handed, so you're speaking to her. So I'm, I'm celebrating that for her. Um, and, you know, I donated. I don't even live in California anymore. I donated because I believe in you and what you're doing. And I'm super excited about you and the change that you're making. So my last question was, which you already answered because you <laughs> go one step ahead, is uh, you are the image of what change in the narrative looks like in West Hollywood. If some young person is out there in our community and wants to be the next Marquita Thomas, what is your advice to them? You said it. Would you like to add to it? Well, I think that the to be the next Marquita Thomas, I mean, I do want everybody to run for office. I do. But I think to be the next Marquita Thomas is just to fill whatever gap. I mean, and that that could be running for office to fill a gap. But it's like I said earlier, I 
realized I was part of the community in April and started throwing parties in November. So if there's a gap, there's so many, there's so few LGBTQ spaces, create a space. If there's um, some sort of service that is needed, start a nonprofit, just, you know, fill the gap and just be a part of the conversation, be a resource and just jump in there and do it. Um, fake it till you make it, you know, but get involved and yeah, uh, yeah fill the gap. That's great. See, this wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be, right? <laughs> I didn't think it was, was going to be bad. I've just been listening to your podcast. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> She's got these extraordinary people who are like, like, I mean, I was like jolly good ginger. And I was just like, hold up. I don't know if listen, I can follow that. Listen, yeah, you can follow it. You're extraordinary. I really respect and appreciate you and what you do. Thank you so much for coming on. 